five years ago in February of 2013 that I was here for five days to perform a Marian mission um, to hopefully encourage you to consecrate yourselves to Our Lady. So it's a it's a great pleasure for me to be back here in Brisbane after after five years to give you this Holy Week recollection um, today, Holy Monday and Holy Tuesday and Holy Wednesday. And really what I want to do during these three days is share with you one of my favorite books on uh, the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the book called uh, Approach to the Crucified. It's a book written by a Benedictine uh, right before the council. His name is Dom Hubert Van Zeller. He just writes little vignettes about each one of the stations. We don't have time to go over all of the stations of the cross that, that he covers in this book. So we will just cover three, one for each of the three days. We will cover the first station, the third station, and the seventh station of the cross. And really, my main focus during this recollection is to try to help you, as Catholics, put on the mentality of our Lord Jesus Christ towards the cross. Isn't it remarkable how we live as Catholics, decade after decade, we can say that the years go by. And as time goes by, we do not seem to change our attitude towards the cross. We seem to have this same desire to avoid the cross. We have not developed this attitude of our Lord to em totally embrace the sufferings that come to us in this life. And this is something that should worry us as Catholics. This is a way we can sort of determine whether we're making progress in our spiritual life. Hopefully all of us have the ambition not just to stay at the basic level uh, of holiness in our lives, that we have this desire to truly imitate Christ in our lives. We know that we're given grace by our Lord Jesus Christ, and that this grace comes from Him hanging on the cross. It's not the same type of grace that Adam and Eve received. When Adam and Eve received grace in their pure condition in the Garden of Eden, it was not from our Lord Jesus Christ. It came directly from God. It did not pass through the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. But they abused this grace by their free will. And they fell and introduced the situation in mankind where man was fallen. And so necessitated our Lord, God himself, to take flesh and become man and fix sin, to become a sin fixer. And as we know, he did this by this supreme moment where he offered his life on the cross. And from that moment, grace has poured down upon the human race from that cross. And that grace comes through. It's, a, it's like that water flowing from the side of our Lord Jesus Christ. And because it's a grace that comes from the cross, it has, as it were, we may say, the flavor of the cross. This particular grace inclines us towards the imitation, the perfect imitation of our Lord for ourselves to take up the cross and follow our Lord on this path of fixing sin. But the thing is, as I say, we often find ourselves after a long time being Catholics, having the same old attitude towards the cross. What attitude is that? It's the attitude of our fallen nature. It's the natural reaction. We can't completely get rid of this natural reaction. It's part of who we are as human beings. I'm not going to ask any one of you in here to like suffering as suffering. But what I want you to do, to try to do, to get you beyond that first stage of the Catholic life is for you to be willing and even to want to accept the sufferings that come to you in your life for the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I want to try to change your attitude towards suffering. I want to hopefully convince you that the sufferings that come to you in this life 
are the best opportunities for you to attain the goal for which you were made. When our Lord came on this earth, there was one main thing that he wanted to accomplish, and that was suffering. And somehow, when we look at our life, and all the things that happen to us, when we say what is most valuable in our life, the last thing we think about to say is the most valuable is our sufferings. And this is the, t- the change that we must try to accomplish, hopefully, in the course of this recollection. In this conference, we will see the first station, the question of the, the question of suffering. Dom uh, Von Zeller, he just has a one word. He has one word which he gives to each one of the stations. The first station is condemnation. But he has this meditation on suffering. Tomorrow, we will see failure. And then on Wednesday, we will see discouragement. And as I say, I want to try to help you accept all these things. Take all these things that are part of the life of every single one of us and bear them in union with the Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. To somehow see in these things that happen to every single one of us in this room, to see in them your means to accomplish the very same work that our Lord accomplished in His life. That is the most important work that you can do in your life. You can become with our Lord like another Redeemer, another sin fixer, to a very limited degree in in comparison with Him, of course. But that's, that's what I myself am supposed to be doing as a priest. That's what you're called to do as Catholics. You are called to defeat sin in your life. And the most powerful thing you have to defeat sin is suffering. That is the means that God himself chose to defeat sin. So we need today to consider very, very broadly the the notion of suffering. I want to give you a very... Following Father Van Zeller, I want to give you a very um, sort of uh, complete perspective on the question of suffering. We know that this, above all things, is is one of the things which, which distinguishes Catholics. So we actually understand suffering. Uh, Protestants, for instance, uh, who, who call themselves Christians and followers of Christ, they just don't get suffering. They do not believe that their sufferings can add to the sufferings of Christ. We know that this is a statement of St. Paul. That St. Paul wants to make up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. And this is our Catholic vision, that we have something to contribute to the passion of our Lord. But to, we, we, what we must do is understand why is that the case? Why is suffering such an important part of our Lord's life? And so also, why is it also an important part of your life? Why is it so necessary for you to embrace the sufferings that come to you in your life? Because by nature, it doesn't seem to make sense. Suffering doesn't seem to have any purpose, any finality. What's the point? The first thing that we have to understand is that suffering does not come from God as such. In other words, if God had his way, there would be no suffering in human existence. The original plan for our race, for human beings, was for there to be absolutely no suffering. God made an order. Okay? He made a, a creation that's been designed to the, the, the finest level of detail. God is the, is the most perfect artist um, creating this world and putting in it an order that, that far exceeds the greatest order that anything we've been able to make with our technology has ever accomplished. The order of creation is an incredible spectacle. 
And if we follow that order, if you follow the order of the way that God has made you, you will be very happy. You will be completely happy in your life. You know, when we buy, when we purchase products, and they come with the user manual. And the user manual says, this is how you use this product. And if you use the product in this way, it will work. And so when you, when you take the car, and you, and you start it, and you get on the road, you drive on the left lane, and you, you put on the brake when you come to, in close to another vehicle, what have you. And if you do that, the car will take you from point A to point B, no problem. Because it's been designed to do that. It's the same with God's creation. God designed human beings for happiness. He made you for happiness. And if we had taken our human nature as he designed it, if we had used it exactly as the user manual indicated, there would be no problem. We would be perfectly happy. And we have to be absolutely convinced of that. We have to be convinced of the fact that we are creatures, that we are designed, that there is a right and a wrong for us according to that design. And that when we follow what God has made us to be, everything works well. Our human nature works famously. It's like a well-run, a well-oiled machine. And if you take the car and, and you, you you drive off the road, or you you try to use it as a battering ram to run into buildings or what have you, and you say, you you, you call up the, the company and you say, hey, you know your your piece of technology is is uh, is faulty. There's something wrong with it. It's not doing what it's supposed to do. I, my, 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 my car is an absolute disaster at this moment. It's, 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 a, it's a heap of, of uh, you know, ruin. And, and it wasn't supposed to be that way. Um, the, the, the car owners or the, the, the car maker would obviously say, well, how did you drive the car? And you said, well, I, I drove it into a building. And he said, well, it's not meant to, to, to be used in that way. If you drive it into a building, it's going to be destroyed. It's not meant to be driven into buildings. And it's the same with human nature. Our, our human nature has not been designed to commit sin. It's not made to commit sin. And when we commit sin, we destroy it. Because we're going against the user's manual. We're going against the way that our human nature has been made. And what happens when we do that? We suffer. We suffer. Suffering comes from man abusing the human nature that's given him by God. That's where suffering comes from. It comes from us taking our human nature and destroying it. For using it in a way that God never intended it to be used. And that's why Father Van Zeller, he says... God doesn't com condemn man to suffering. Man condemns himself to suffering. Man chooses to use his own free will to destroy himself. And we should not be surprised um, that when we do that, we shouldn't call God up. We shouldn't say to God, hey, this is not fair. Why, why is this happening? You shouldn't allow this to happen. You shouldn't allow me to suffer. It's just like us calling up the, the, the car company. They would say, well, you used, you used it in, in a way that was abusive. Above all, we must see that sin introduces a conflict within ourselves. It's not primarily a conflict with our neighbor, but... but Sin destroys us internally. It rips us apart. We have a certain integrity. We have a certain wholeness. We have a certain completeness that we're made for. And when we commit sin, we just sort of rip that apart. Our, our, our human nature is tending this way, and we're, we're yanking it with our free will, and we're, we're directing it in another way that it's not intended for. And so the main opposition and conflict that exists is between us and our human nature. That is the primary source 
of our own suffering. Of course, this fault line that, that, that runs through our hearts, this, this, this line of division, you know, when, when you have an, an earthquake, there's the, the, the plates of the earth are slowly separating. And, and there's, like, there's like plates in us. There's, there's these um, parts of, of our human nature that are meant to, to bind together seamlessly as a single whole. But when we commit sin, they start to rip apart. And you know what happens when you have, when you have an earthquake and the, and the plates start to separate and the buildings start to topple. When we rip apart our human nature, we, we start to become unstable. We start to become very emotional. We start to lose control of our lives. That's what happens. And because of that, we suffer very much. That's the primary fault line that exists in the life of every single one of us. That's the major problem, the major source of suffering. But of course, this fault line also runs through the world. There's disorder all around us, this, this collectivity of human individuals all wanting to redesign human nature, to want to um, put out a new edition of the user's manual wherein the user's manual says, you can do whatever you want. And if you do whatever you want, you will be happy. You can do whatever you want with, 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 your, with your car. You, know, you, can, you can drive it over cliffs, um, you can drive it into buildings, you, you can drive it reverse for hundreds of kilometers, you can do whatever you want, and it will always, always work out well. This is the message of, of the modern world. You can change yourself from a girl into a boy. You can uh, marry someone of the same sex. You can destroy the life in your womb. And everything will be perfectly suitable because you want it. The user manual today says, do whatever you want and you will be happy. Of course, this is uh, a complete denial of the fact that we are created. Okay, so the fact is that Suffering comes from us. We've introduced suffering into the world. We've rebelled against our own happiness. We have rejected our own happiness by our own free, free will. We've abused our own free will. Now, what does God think when he looks at that? What does God think when he looks on the world and he sees just human beings wrecking his own creation? Obviously, there's, there's many different things that, that God could do. But what we must um, especially appreciate in the context of, of Holy Week, and we must come back to time and again in our Catholic life, is, is to realize the freedom of God and His choice of becoming man in order to fix our disorder. God could have left us to just continue to wreck ourselves. And we would have um, wrecked ourselves much worse even than, than we've already done it if, if he had chosen to remain indifferent. But in the end, God did not want our own disorder to defeat his goodness. So he's going to step in and he's going to fix the problems that we've caused. But he's not going to fix it totally. He's not going to get rid of sin. Because to do that, he would have to get rid of free will. The only way he could definitively and certainly stop men from destroying themselves would be for him to take away their free will. But God doesn't change his plans. God doesn't take away his gifts. And whenever an atheist that talks to you and says, well, you know, if there was a good God, then there would be no evil. We've been addressing that objection for millennia. And it's a weak objection. Because 
God cannot take away evil without taking away free will. And if God's going to give you free will, He's going to allow you to use your free will. He's going to allow you to use it. He's going to allow you to abuse it. If you want to abuse your free will, God's going to say, well, I gave it to you. He's going to help you use it correctly and follow the user's manual. But if you don't want to do that, He's going to let you do it. Because He respects what He's done. He respects the free will that He's given you. So He's not going to take away free will. And so when our Lord comes down on this earth, he's, He doesn't fix sin by taking away your free will. And this has enormous consequences for us. What it means is that God takes a world full of suffering and He works with that kind of world. He works. He, he comes to a world that's full of disorder, that's full of, of human beings abusing their free will. And He doesn't stop the suffering. He doesn't stop absolutely the damage that they are doing. But he works with this new order wherein you have a creation that, where suffering exists and he chooses to use that order in order to give us a means to happiness. A new means to happiness which is really the same old means. The original plan was we follow the will of God, we follow the user's manual, we do what we're supposed to do as human beings, we will be happy. Our Lord comes to this world that's full of rebellious human beings destroying themselves, and He says, the rules are still the same. If you follow my will, in the midst of all the sufferings of your life, and you bear these sufferings for love of me as a part of divine providence, then you will be happy. You will be happy in this life, and you will be happy in the next. So in a certain sense, we can say the rules have not changed. Before the fall, after the fall, it's still a question of us following the will of God. The only difference is now, after sin, following the will of God includes bearing with sufferings for the love of God. God wants you to bear with the sufferings of this life. And He guarantees you that if you bear with the sufferings for the love of Him, you will be happy. You will reach your completion. The proper functioning of human nature in a world that's full of sin is to bear suffering for the love of God. This, we must be convinced as Catholics, you must try to be convinced that your happiness in this life is doing the will of God no matter what. Whether things are going smoothly, whether things are going badly, whatever, everything that happens to you in this life comes under the providence of God. I accept it and I bear it. And even more than that, when, it, when God asks us to bear suffering, when God asks us, in other words, to bear the brunt of our own rebellion, by bearing it for the love of God, we find our ultimate completion in this life. It is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, this grace coming from the cross, that gives us the power to do this. When you receive baptism, your soul was washed from sin. We got the sin away. But also, there was poured into your soul virtues, especially the theological virtues, the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, the, the moral virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. And these virtues give you the power to do something superhuman, and that is to bear with sufferings for the love of God. Here's what happens. Don Zeller, he portrays the theological virtues like a flame of happiness in our breast. This flame of faith, hope, and charity. We have a purpose. We have this love of God. We have this belief in God. We are anchored in our Creator. We are directed towards 
um, the meaning of, of our very nature. Everything's running smoothly. And then suffering comes along. And what suffering times tries to do is, is come on top of that flame and completely extinguish it. But for the soul that's burning with this fuel, this special fuel of faith, hope, and charity especially, that soul will accept the essential condition of this life, which is being obedient to the will of God. This condition of following the plan of the user's manual and accepting whatever comes to us. If we do this, as I say, we have an absolute guarantee that we will be happy. Do we believe this? Do you believe that you can be happy in the midst of suffering? It's guaranteed that you're going to suffer. You've already experienced suffering in your life. It's guaranteed you're going to suffer more in this life. There's no question about it. You don't know what sufferings will be ahead of you. There will definitely be sufferings. But do you believe, you, you, you're convinced about that, but do you believe that if you bear those sufferings for the love of God, you will actually be happy in those sufferings? Really, it's one way or the other. It's, it's one or the other. Either you will learn to accept the sufferings that come to you with a supernatural spirit, with the same spirit that our Lord Himself had on the cross, or you will have that natural reaction, that reaction that says, no, I don't want this. I don't want the annoyance of my children. I don't want the annoyance of my spouse. When people cut me off in the road, I'm going to get upset. I'm going to engage in a certain species of road rage. You know, when things don't work out for me, when people say things that I don't like, when people aren't cooperative, when my, my loved ones who, who I live with on a daily basis, when they, when they just have those mannerisms that I don't like, and it causes me to suffer just a little bit, I'm going to rebel. Or I'm going to say, this is it. This is that occasion for me to accept these sufferings for the love of God. And walk away happy and in fact spreading happiness all around me it's an incredible power it's an incredible strength the grace of Christ gives you the strength if you look at the passion of our Lord if you look at the 14 stations it's unbelievable his attitude towards all the people whom he comes in contact with just think about if, if, if you if you had been scourged to that to that degree now we can look at the shroud and say probably about 120 scourges. And if you had a, a crown of thorns on your head, screaming pain, shooting through your body, and people were coming up to you, you would be in an absolute and total rage. But all we see in our Lord's passion is utter self-forgetfulness when he comes into contact with people. This acts of mercy, acts of charity towards other people when he comes into contact with. It's, it's, it's a strength that's, that's totally beyond human strength. It's one of the arguments that, that can be used from the Shroud of Turin. You see, look at the, that face. That face is not the face of someone who's been tortured on a cross. It's a face of absolute serenity, total serenity. This is not something that a normal human being would think crucified. They, we, have, we have pictures, we, we, not pictures, but we, we have skeletons of, of people who were crucified in Roman times. They don't look like that. They, they look um, completely distorted. They look like they're a wreck of a human being. But our Lord in the shroud has a look of total serenity, even though he faced sufferings that far exceed anything you've ever suffered. Think about your sufferings. Think about the things you suffered in this life. You know, what about the things you suffered today? 
I came from Goldburn. It was 10 degrees when I left Goldburn. Um, it was cold, and then when I came here, it was just like 30 degrees and really humid. And it's just like, what's going on here? This is, I mean, this is just an example with the weather. We, we tend to react to just even something so trivial as the weather with an act of rebellion. It's like, this is not right. I, you know, we start complaining. The major problem that we have in this life is we don't know what happiness looks like. We're looking for the wrong type of happiness. We're very confused about what makes us happy and what doesn't make us happy. And what happens is our human heart, which is so foolish, is always going out to all these things that we think are going to make us happy. And we attach ourselves to them. And what we find is we suck them dry of all the, the happiness they can give. And we very soon we exhaust all the possible happiness. It's a very superficial happiness. And we're disappointed. And we go look for something else. Something just as trivial. The happiness we are meant to have in this life is happiness in the accomplishment of the will of God. That's part of the user's manual. If we look for another happiness, whether it be in pleasure, fame, glory, comfort, whatever it may be, we will not get it. We will not get it. Here's what Dom Zeller says. Lacking the happiness we are meant to have, we go on being unhappy in the happiness which we are not meant to have. Thinking ourselves to be always on the verge of discovering what we want, we anticipate the decrees of God. This is going to be satisfying at last, we say, concentrating on the satisfaction of the moment. So I can call this beatitude and not worry about any other. Then that beatitude fades and we find ourselves back at worrying about another beatitude. We just chuck it out. We said that didn't work. We have this seems seemingly perpetual foolishness. Well, we're always convinced that the next one's going to be the right one. You know, it's like playing the lottery over and over again. The next one is going to be the winning ticket. I know I'm going to win next time. Is it, I've got to win next time. You know, we keep playing. We keep wasting our life. We waste our resources. We keep playing this game. We don't realize that yeah, it's not going to happen. If we look single-mindedly at the happiness which God holds out to us, the happiness which is not an end in itself, but goes along with seeking first His kingdom, we would not have to worry about any other happiness. We would be happy without anxiety. Such is peace. Only God can give this. The world cannot. Apart from that peace, all happiness is ephemeral passing. All happiness is at the mercy of either fear, remorse, doubt, exhaustion, or anti-climax. I'm so looking forward to this happiness. And then I pour myself into this happiness and you get there and you're just like, yeah, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It wasn't so fantastic after all. If man will not accept security in God, then he condemns himself to insecurity. God does not condemn him. He condemns himself. So our Lord knew all of our problems. He knew our proclivity to seek happiness in anything that is not the will of God. Anything that is not according to the plan for our human nature. And so what he wanted to do when he came on this earth is he wanted to redeem us in the best way possible. And his solution to all of our problems, to all of the suffering that we've introduced into this world, was for himself to embrace suffering in a way that is so total, so complete, that we cannot be mistaken about what we are meant to do in this life. We can no longer be mistaken when he says, if you want to follow me, take up your cross. If you're not able to take up the cross, you're not worthy of me. 
In other words, after the fall, our path to happiness in this life, our path to happiness in the next life, is by taking up the sufferings that come to us and accepting them for the love of God. When our Lord came on this earth, He decided that there was nothing more important for Him to do than to take on suffering. And we cannot improve upon His life. We cannot do better than what He did. And so it's true for you as well. I'm not asking you to volunteer for sufferings. I'm not asking you to to, um, inflict sufferings willfully on yourself or on others. I mean, we do that to a certain degree during Lent. Hopefully we do some fasting. Hopefully we do some mortification. Hopefully we say some extra prayers. But by and large, we are meant to accept the sufferings. We don't do well at that. Okay, when you get good at that, when you get good at um, taking the sufferings that come to you and you say, I want to accept this. There's the first reaction of rebellion, but then you overcome that with grace. And you say, I want to accept this in order to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ, in order to fulfill the purpose for which God has made me, in order to draw ground graces upon myself. If you're able to do that, then you have accomplished so much in your Catholic life for your path to holiness. So, my dear faithful, this is the broad perspective of suffering. This is the meaning of suffering. Suffering is a part of our world because men have rebelled against God. And God has not chosen to get rid of suffering. He's not going to remove suffering because to do that, He would have to destroy His own creation. He would have to start over. He would have to start making human beings without free will. And he's not going to do that. So what He's going to do is he going to, He's going to take our world full of suffering. And He's going to show us how to use that suffering to be happy. And so He, he died. He Himself dies on the cross for our sins. And He merits this grace which He gives to you. This grace that flows from His side. His broken body. And He communicates to you that grace. And that grace gives you the power in the midst of suffering to accept it for the love of our Lord. To bear your cross daily. And so in doing so, to actually be happy in all the stress and trials of your life. This is what God has called you to do. I invite you to try to use the graces that our Lord gives you every day to accept these sufferings.